Ginger, about 30 or so minutes, I think, will be about the sermon length, unless the Lord decides to go a different way. For those who were at home, welcome. It's always good to see you. If it's your first time tuning in, don't be afraid to drop us a note on Facebook as you're watching, just to say hi. We'll love to touch base with you, follow up in the days ahead, potentially. As you folks are dismissed, just please do so quietly. Everybody at home is listening in. Merry Christmas to one and all. Merry Christmas to those of you who are at home as well. It's my joy to bring forth this Sunday morning message as we gather to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I pray that his spirit this morning would open our hearts to receive, to embrace, and to ultimately apply what we shall learn this morning. I'll give you just 10 more seconds to make your way to a seat or for the little ones to head downstairs. Let's begin. A series of timeless characters appear in the birth narratives of Jesus Christ, perhaps none more central than that of a young girl named Mary. How many have heard of Mary before in relation to the Christmas story? Now, I want you to consider this morning that this young girl, a virgin, who was betrothed to a man named Joseph, was told that she would supernaturally conceive a child who would ultimately change the course of human history. A child who would be called, per the words of Scripture through the angel Gabriel, the Son of the Most High, reigning over a kingdom that would never end. Now, I want us to begin to access the story a little bit this morning. I want to ask you this morning, for those who are here, for those who are at home, if you were in Mary's shoes, perhaps potentially more applicable to the ladies, what might you feel toward that singular calling? An angel appears to you and says that you are going to supernaturally conceive outside of the bounds of marriage through the power of the Spirit of God and that the child that you bring forth would ultimately be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords forever. Now that's not the point this morning that I want to begin to make, but I want to begin to wade into these waters. Now more importantly for the sake of our discussion this morning, as the sermon title will reveal, I, I often ponder, especially at this time of the year, what did Mary know or understand regarding the unique nature and mission of her baby boy? Now this is a question that for some time has fascinated scholars, students of the Bible for ages, and in many ways I want you to hear me when I say this, the answer will forever elude us as the word of God is truly silent in many regards regarding Mary in her response to the very prophetic words that came forth regarding her son. All it says in the Bible regarding Mary and her take on the matter was this, Luke 2, verse 19, Mary treasured all these things, treasured up all these things, and she pondered them in her heart. Now, what did she ponder? What did she understand? Honestly, we do not know because we cannot assume to read into what the Bible does not specifically say. But that does not stop us from speculating what did Mary know. And in fact, for those of you who like music, one of the more famous songs of the holiday season causes us to wonder, to speculate, if you will, at the breadth and the depth of Mary's insight. Through a song entitled, Mary, Did You Know? How many have heard the song, Mary, Did You Know Before? Excellent. If you have not, uh, when you leave this place, put it on an, uh, YouTube or iTunes, something, and, and listen to it. It's a beautiful song. Now, there are physical copies provided all around the sanctuary. Those of you who are at home, of course, I couldn't provide you a physical copy, but I'll still make it plain as we go along. Now, I have chosen not to play a recording of the song this morning, and I have also chosen not to sing it to you. I contemplated. There was a part of me that was like, I'm, I could pull this off. I got married, as you know. Taryn can make me sound good on the soundboard. I have, however, chosen to look at the lyrics of the song with you, kind of line by line in a sense, as I think that the themes that they touch on really are worthy of our corporate attention. So if you know the song, wonderful, but I want to access a little bit of the deeper theology of it, if you will, what it reveals about the nature of Christ and his work. And again, we wrestle with this question, what did Mary know? So those of you with the song in front of you, what's the opening line? Mary, did you know specifically what? What is the author, the lyricist, questioning. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Now, I want to stop there. We're going to go slow. I'm not in a rush this morning. I want this to marinate a little bit. 
I have to wonder, did Mary perceive in the infancy of Jesus that he would go on to control the natural elements of this world, as the rest of the gospel record indicates. I'm going to just read this to you because I want you to recognize that in the adult life and ministry of Jesus, he did control the earthly elements and do things like walk on the water. This is from Matthew 14. Don't turn there for the sake of time. There's a lot of Bible this morning, but jot down the reference or download the notes when it's posted on the church website. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. Quick side note, I would never hop in a boat with Jesus because that's always going to go some odd direction, but there's a point in it. He made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Now, after he had dismissed the crowd, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Now, later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land. Now, what was the condition of the boat? It was being buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Now, I want you to keep in mind that there were several, a handful of expert fishermen who spent their lives on body of water. But still, in, in these moments, even their expertise, their human capacity, their background, it still did not avail them, and they would still look to Jesus at various points, whether he was sleeping in the stern of the boat or in this moment, as they're going to see him do something rather incredible. It says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went to them, walking on the water, walking on the lake. Now, all eyes this way. Has anyone in the sound of my voice here or at home ever successfully walked on water? Why not? Not ice. Oh, come on, you New Englanders. There's always one in the crowd. Yeah, for those tuning in from Florida, perhaps, we have this thing called ice up here, and it's lovely. I'm talking liquid water. I'll be overly specific. The answer is no. And the answer is no the answer is no, because we are subject to the laws that govern our creation or this creation. But the Lord, being the creator, can transcend such laws and even do things like walk on the water. Now, Jesus comes to them. Imagine you're these disciples and you're watching Jesus walk toward you. He says, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And when he climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And this is the reaction of those who were in the boat. They worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Yet we have to wonder in his infancy, did Mary truly comprehend the potential in the ultimate capacity of her son? We do not know. The song continues this morning that her baby boy would, would do what else? Help the pastor out. Beyond walk on water, what's the next line? Save our sons and daughters. Now, this is where it begins to get a little bit deeper. Did Mary truly perceive that her child would be the source of eternal life to the lost sons and daughters of Adam and Eve? Did she understand the core of the gospel message that you and I preach and proclaim and believe? The gospel message specifically that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And Jesus in his adult ministry said of himself that the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, moving on in the lyrics, did Mary know that her baby boy had come to make her new and that the child that she had delivered would soon deliver, in this case, her? Did Mary understand? Because this lyric speaks to the power of Christ, and this is where I want to spend a little bit of time. The power of Christ to deliver us from two things. Write these down, my note takers. The penalty and the power of sin. Did Mary understand Jesus' ultimate mission to deliver us, to rescue us, to redeem us from both the power and the penalty of sin. I want to talk about the penalty of sin first. How many of us, in the sound of my voice, have sinned at some point in your life? Congratulations, all of you. All of us. And if you say that you have not, congratulations, you're lying, which is still a sin. What's the wages of sin, biblically? We need, to, we need to understand the gravity of that. A couple days ago, or a couple weeks ago, shopping for Thanksgiving, I 
parked my car. It was a new vehicle. My lease had expired, and I went inside, and I came back outside with a cart full of groceries. And you know what happened to Pastor James? I couldn't find my car. You know what that's called? That's called a human mistake. But you know what it's called when we lie? Or we operate in greed? Or we traffic in gossip? That's called a choice. That's sin. Sin is a deliberate rejection of God's will and ways, no matter how big or small. And the ultimate wages of all sin is, help the pastor out, death. That's bad news. Every human ever born of man and woman, that's an important point, is guilty, universally guilty of this thing called sin. And more than that, we are actually inclined towards sin. How many of you find it easier to retaliate when somebody wrongs you than forgive them? As I say laughingly, if I set before you a large red button and say, don't hit the big red button, what do you want to do? Why? Because we're sinful. Within, we are just warped. We are crooked. We are depraved. We like to sin. As much as in our own strength we'd like to resist it, we can't. And Jesus said on this point, and I shared this in recent weeks, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins, how many is that? All of us. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So not only am I guilty of this thing called sin, for which I will incur penalty, but I actually can't stop on my own. I just continue to compound more and more and more judgment on myself. And the same is true for you. Can you imagine if you had to give an accurate total or rendering of how many sins you've committed in your life? 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, and I'll stop there. Thousands upon thousands, potentially a day. Each uniquely deserving of punishment. Death. Now that's the bad news. Now the good news is this. Jesus Christ is willing to forgive. He's provided the mechanism and the means whereby we can be forgiven. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. Romans 6. But... The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, he's provided every means for you to receive pardon for what you have done. You can't earn it. You can't attain it. All you can do is receive it as a free gift offered to you by God's grace that you receive through faith. Now, this is Christianity 101. But this refresher is good for those of you who believe, and it's very good for those of you who perhaps had never really even heard this. I was raised in an environment with my background, religiously or irreligiously, that I just thought that being a good person was enough. And that sounds good until you begin to think about it. For those who maybe are at home and you are banking your eternity on how good you can behave, I pose to you the question, how good do you have to be? How do you know when you're good enough? If you're banking your eternity on the fact that you're good enough, whatever that means to you, how do you know that you actually are? You see, the Bible is very clear. We're all guilty. It's universal. There are no exceptions. If you have an earthly father and a mother, you inherit it. You begin in that condition. And because you're fallen, we just continually compound it one upon the other upon the other. But in Christ, there's forgiveness. But it's a gift that you have to receive. If you're here this morning and you haven't received this gift, if you're banking on anything else, anything else for your eternity, please change your direction. Beautiful biblical word, repent. Change direction. Secondly, to this point, he also offers a new heart to those who do believe. Which means that when you come to faith in him and he comes to dwell within you, you are no longer left to your own capacity, which is continually subject to failure in going the wrong way. Now the Lord dwells within you so that over time as you are his, he begins to cultivate within you things like love and joy, peace. I love the next one. Not just patience, long-suffering kindness, and a whole host of other things. So that over time, we are liberated more and more and more from how we used to live, and we are conformed more and more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. Here's an Old Testament promise that speaks to the age in which we live, the new covenant. The Lord said, I will give you a new heart. 
and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give to you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you, and here's what I love, and I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. In other words, Christianity is not an outside-in religion. It's not about perfecting the externalities of religion, behaving according to a certain ordinance, what I wear, how I talk. It's an internal transformation that begins at the moment you become his, because once you let him in, he's not content to leave you in the condition that he found you in. He begins to renovate and transform so that over time, you no longer have to live back in Egypt, proverbially, the land of bondage, you can move to the promised land in him. If anyone is in Christ, he is a what? It's not hyperbole. Something supernatural has happened. And it's our role as believers to partner with that, to yield to that, and to continue in the process. But again, I asked, did Mary understand this? Could Mary, holding this infant child, possibly conceive of the idea that this would be the one to undo the curse that we all experience? Moving on, did Mary know that her baby boy would give sight to those who were blind? How many recognize, I'm not going to linger long on this point, that in the adult life and ministry of Jesus, healing was a common thing in his ministry. It happened a lot. He would, heal the, he would heal those who were blind. He would give them sight. He would open the ears of the deaf. He would cause those who were mute to speak. He would cause lepers to be cleansed and beyond. We see time and time and time again that the ministry of Jesus Christ was characterized by the supernatural. But again, did Mary, holding this infant, understand the depth in the capacity of this child? Similarly, the next point, did Mary know that her baby boy would what? What does it say next? Would calm a storm with his hand. Very similar to Christ walking on water in his ministry, he demonstrated authority over the natural realm. Next time there's a thunderstorm. Better yet, next time there's a nor'easter. I'm so done with snow. 42 years in the snow, minus three that I spent in Florida. Next time there's a nor'easter and the wind is a blowing and the snow is a fallen, that's a scientific way of saying it, go outside and tell it to stop. Good luck. Because again, we are creations, but Christ is the creator. And we see in his ministry the capacity to speak to wind and waves, and they actually listen. Storms clear up. Progressing in the song, did Mary know that her baby boy, I love this next one. This is where it begins to shift gears and cause us to wonder a little bit more. Did you know that your baby boy had walked where angels trod? Did Mary understand the glory that Jesus Christ had before he even came? Now, this is an important point. When Jesus was born into this earth, and even a little bit before when he was conceived, that is not the moment that he was created. You see, I was born on July 4th, 1978. Very good year from what I'm told, minus the blizzard. If you go back nine or ten months before that, that's the moment I was conceived. But where was James Foley before that? Nowhere. Nowhere. Because I uniquely began to exist as a person at the moment of conception and then later when I was brought into this world. But that's not the case with Jesus. How long has Jesus existed? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Jesus experienced something that no one else has ever experienced. This idea of pre-incarnate glory. A glory, a heavenly experience before he even came. So in a sense, Jesus wasn't just born. He had arrived. It was a coming, the first coming. And we see this reality on the night of his betrayal. Jesus said the following, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you when before the world began. That's an amazing thought. You see, to Mary, was Jesus just a nine or a ten month old you know, being that was conceived that, that period before? Did she understand there was something more? We'll never know. Did she perceive that when she kissed her child, she kissed the face of God? 
There's a great theology word. It's not found in the Bible, but a lot of good biblical principles aren't necessarily verbatim in there. The word Trinity, for instance, is not in the Bible. It's a word that we have coined to describe what the Bible teaches. There's a good word called incarnation. And it's a miracle. It's the miracle of God taking upon himself human flesh. Help me out. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But a little bit later on it says the following. And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This idea that Jesus wasn't just an average person. There was something other about him because truly, biblically, scripturally speaking, he was God in the flesh. That's why Jesus himself could say things like, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. I love what it says in Hebrews 1, the Son, speaking of Christ, is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being. So if you want to understand the will of the Father, look to the Son. If you want to understand the wisdom, the way to live according to the Father, look to how the Son lived. If you want to know what's right and wrong in the eyes of the Father, consider what the Son had to say, because Jesus was uniquely God in the flesh. All lies this way. I want you to imagine that you were in the crowd experiencing the adult ministry of Jesus, and you could see him as easily as I could see you. What would it be like to look into the eyes of a person and recognize it's not just a person? It's actually God. It kind of hurts your head. And I don't think that those who really knew Jesus in his adult ministry really even understood then the fullness of who and what they were dealing with. It was only perhaps until a little bit after that they began to kind of put two and two together and the information traveled from their head to their heart. We move on. I love the bridge of the song. I wish I could sing it, but I love you too much to do that. The blind will see and the deaf will hear. The dead will live again. The lame will leap and the dumb will speak what? The praises of the Lamb. Did Mary understand her son's ability to change lives for time in eternity? That those who were blind would be given sight. That those who were deaf would be given hearing. That those who were dead would be physically and literally brought back to life. That people who were lame and couldn't walk would be given the ability to walk. And the people who couldn't speak would be given the ability to praise the Lord. You see, the Apostle John, in his age, many years after, he foresaw a coming time of worship. And I want to read this to you from Revelation 7, verse 9. John speaking, I looked, and there before me, use your imagination. I want you to see what John is describing here. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count. Can you see it? From every tribe every nation, every people, every language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice. This is their never-ending chorus, in a sense. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Do you realize that when you get to heaven, there will already be people there? I don't know how many. Lots. And they won't all look like you. And they won't all sound like you. Wouldn't it be amazing to see people of different cultures, not just white Caucasians, but every tribe, every people group, and maybe hearing even languages of the earth in heaven to hear people worshiping the Lord in a variety of tongues, but all in a unified sense of, of community where they recognize the wonder of the one who saved them and transformed them. Even in this room, I see a bunch of very different people. But you know what we have in common? It's him. And in him we find forgiveness. And in him we find transformation and renewal. And one day we are all destined to be a part of a never-ending chorus that will continue on and on and on where Christ will forever be worshipped. You know what they call this morning? Practice. 
It's a warm-up. We did 30 minutes and we're tired. Wait until we go 3,000 years straight. And that's just the beginning. It will never end. But did Mary know that? Could she perceive all of that? Again, just holding this precious little child. Moving quickly now for the sake of time, did she recognize that her baby boy was the Lord of all creation? What's the word Lord mean? Master. Whatever you call the Lord, the, God the Lord, in reference to yourself, Lord, you're my Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. It's master. Who was destined to rule the nations. I'm going to read to you one quick verse. This is from the book of Isaiah chapter 9. Prophetically it says, Speaking of Jesus, to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called. Four wonderful titles, by the way. There's a whole sermon in this. A wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father in prince of peace and this is what isaiah foresaw of the greatness of his government whose government his of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end he will reign on david's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this. Do you realize that that Christ child who came into this world almost 2,000 years ago has been, is, and will always be Lord of all creation? The issue is the creation doesn't yet fully understand that reality and hasn't yet taken the knee. But guess what? The day is coming when every tongue will confess and every knee will bow and Jesus will be universally hailed and recognized as king. Did Mary know that her baby boy was heaven's perfect lamb? A lamb speaks of a substitute. Something that's sacrificed and offered as an atonement for sin so that the human could be free. In the Old Testament, if you lived in the Levitical age in the days of Moses and following and you committed some sin, you did something wrong, it was necessary for you to take an animal, a lamb, etc., and to sacrifice that thing, basically communicating, Lord, I deserve death, but you and your grace have chosen to allow this animal to die in my place. Many years later, when John the Baptist saw the adult Jesus and said, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, he recognized something in Jesus' ministry that ultimately he would offer himself as not just a sacrifice for sin, but the final once-for-all atonement for sin. When you sin, can you imagine just the logistical nightmare it would be to always have to offer an animal sacrifice? Not just once a year, but just a continual thing. Because how many of us mess up a lot? It's said that on the days of Passover and beyond in the ancient times that blood would literally fill the street because there was so much sacrifice going on for the nation in need. But Jesus replaced all of that being the ultimate substitute. Even Jesus himself said the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to do what else? To give his life as a ransom for many. He is the payment whereby we can be set free. Final point, and I'll close. Did Mary realize that the sleeping child that she was holding was in fact what? What does it say? The great I am. Now there's a whole lesson in this. I'm going to give it to you in three sentences, so buckle up. I am was the sacred name for God against the ancient, amongst the ancient Jewish people. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, you can tell when this word is used because you will see the word Lord, but it'll be in all capital letters, okay? So when you're on your own reading the Bible and you're in the Old Testament and you see Lord, but it's all in capital letters, that's this word, this Hebrew word being used that we translate as I am. This was the name that God used to reveal himself to Moses in the account of the burning bush. And Jesus himself, many centuries later, connected himself with that name in the following verse. Jesus told the people, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was, this great patriarch, before Abraham was, I am. Now, interestingly, the I am who sent Moses to rescue the Jews from slavery and bondage in Egypt had himself come in human form to deliver us. 
but not from Egypt, but from the bondage of sin and death. And it is in Christ that we find spiritual liberty, release, renewal, and life, both life abundant and life eternal. But could Mary have possibly understood that the child that she held, who would go on to do all of these things, was truly the great I am that she had spent her life hearing about and reading about, and now she was called upon to raise. I close with this. What did Mary know about her child? Did she understand his nature and work? You ready for the answer? We have no idea. The Bible is silent on these matters, and though we can speculate, and though it's fun to look at songs like this where we wrestle with these questions, we as, as believers, biblically informed believers, we cannot be overly dogmatic on these things because we're speaking in an absence of knowledge and, and insight. But I think this morning as we close that there is a more pressing and urgent question, and it's this. What do you know? What do you know about Jesus Christ? And what do you believe to be true about him? And based upon that, how does that inform your life and living? I put before you a series of questions that I want you to wrestle with and consider. Christian, do you recognize his divine power? Do you understand that the one who walked on the water, calmed the storm, gave sight to the blind man, raised the dead, opened the ears of the deaf, deaf and beyond, is still very much alive and well? And here's the key. He's willing to work the miraculous on the behalf of those who look to him in faith. Don't tell me you have a problem that's bigger than the Lord. But pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't need to because I understand and know the one who made you. And if he has a purpose and a plan for you, which he does, and it's good and it's filled and infused with a sense of hope and beyond, don't tell me there's something in your life that's greater than him whatever it may be. If it's a physical issue, if it's a physical malady, you know what you should do? Look to him for healing. He's still the God who heals. If it's something emotional, we live in a generation of people that are, live in a state of anxiety, depression, and beyond. Now, I'm not knocking the place of medicine and counselors, but many of us need much more of the truth of who he is in our lives, and so many other things would begin to fall into place. Because when you understand the power that is available in him through and for you, you don't have to live in a place of despair and fear, because you are connected to the one who is capable and able and willing to move whatever mountain you may be facing. Do you realize that Jesus is still able and willing to deliver you from the penalty of sin and the power thereof? If you this morning are not yet pardoned of your sin, let's get that thing under the blood. Confess him as Savior and Lord. He is faithful and he is just to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness. And if you say to yourself that there is a lingering sin that you just cannot seem to shake, there's a sin that easily besets you, whatever it may be, and we're all different. Do you realize he's still able to give you his power to overcome that, to transform you, to become what he has called you to be? Do you know that he's coming again? All eyes this way, I need to see your eyes. Do you know that he's coming again? The answer is yes. And he is coming to establish a rule in a reign that will never end. And by the way, it's a rule in a reign you absolutely want to be a part of. It is far better to be a citizen of his kingdom than to be an outsider and an alien and a foreigner in that sense. Come into the kingdom by faith and you will experience blessing now and forevermore. Do you recognize, as I mentioned earlier, that a time is coming when all who have been touched in saved and transformed and changed by him will assemble i can't wait for this moment to give him the praise that he rightfully deserves in an assembly that will never end and i end with this do you realize that the child that we celebrate at christmas grew up to give his life for you and for me that we might be his forever you see we can know these things in our head but do you know them in your heart have these things actually become something significant to you that by faith they inform and you impact how you live? Because if so, you can live Christmas all year long. 
You can be the kind of person he wants you to be. And I'm calling you to give yourself to him by faith this morning. You see, gang, it doesn't really matter what Mary knew in centuries past. It does matter what you know today. And I want to close in prayer, and then I have one quick announcement. Father, we come before you this morning, and we humble ourselves in your mighty presence. Lord, there are many in the sound of my voice who have known you for decades, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for their example, their witness, their testimony. I pray that you would cause them to know you more, that they would have deeper, broader insight into the wonder that is Jesus as we turn our eyes toward you. The things of this earth, they go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord, for those who maybe have been walking with you for a shorter period of time, they're still navigating this thing. They're still getting their, their footing in the fundamentals. God, draw them to you. May the truths that have been shared this morning be transferred from their intellect to a deep spiritual place within, and may you bring forth fruit in kind. And Lord, for those who have heard today, and they don't know you, to them you're nothing more than a character they maybe talk about once a year at Christmas or at Easter. God, I pray that you would open their hearts to receive, and that this would be that moment for them of salvation, to come to experience Jesus in all of his wonder and glory. We confess our sin to you. We give ourselves to you in faith. And we trust you for time and for eternity in the name of Jesus Christ. And everyone says, Amen.